This is a paid advertisement for Herman Law. Welcome to today's program. I'm Dr. Wendy Walsh, and with me today is sex abuse attorney Jeff Herman, a nationally recognized trial lawyer and advocate for survivors of rape, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation. Jeff's firm, Herman Law, is one of the nation's most prominent personal injury law firms, specializing in the representation of victims of sexual abuse in civil cases. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Dr. Walsh. Based on your experience, who are the typical perpetrators? So, interesting. You know, if you, if you ask somebody, why do bank robbers rob banks? It's because that's where the money is. And so the same thing holds true for child predators. We find them where the kids are. Now, of course, there is a, a huge number of predators that are familial type of relationships and, and incest relationships, step parents, and that, that's really unfortunate. But the work that I do typically involves institutional defendants. And the institutions that I see most times are the Catholic Church, by far, other churches and temples, absolutely, there, there, there's predators there, schools, uh, Boy Scouts, uh, foster homes, orphanages, any place where there's kids, there's going to be predators. You know, and people ask me, well, you know, why so much in the Catholic Church? You know, why is that? And unfortunately, what we know is that this is not a new problem for the Catholic Church. And for decades, even hundreds of years, the church has known that priests were masquerading as men of God and using their position in the church to get access to kids and molest them. And part of the problem is that the church has always believed in this secrecy. And in fact, there's what they call canons of law, which are the guidelines the church follows that requires them, the church, to keep things secret. And so for a predator, it was a perfect place to go because if they got, they had access to kids and if they got caught, they would be protected. And the church became a refuge because it was well known that the church was protecting predators. They were covering it up. They were sending them to different churches. And so there's a huge problem. Now, Jeff, when I hear you talking like this, it makes me wonder, are you attacking religions? Are you attacking specific churches? Right. And I get that question a lot. What I'm doing is protecting children. I don't care what denomination the perp comes from. I don't care if it's a Catholic priest, a Buddhist priest, a Jewish rabbi. If they're molesting children, I'm coming after them. Well, you talk about religious institutions, but what about schools? I see this all the time in my experience. I get cases, unfortunately, way too often where there's a man working at a preschool or a daycare that's molested kids there. And I will tell you, it's almost always the man who's working there. In fact, when I get a case, it's usually the only man working at the preschool or the daycare. And so this is a real problem, and I think Parents and institutions need to be more serious about protecting kids. If there's a man working in a preschool, I want to know why he's working there. And I want to make sure there are no red flags. And if there are, I want erring on the side of caution and that person removed. Too often, I get cases where there were warning signs and there were reports and the man was left in the preschool with these very vulnerable little kids. You know, Jeff, in cases that involve public or private entities like schools, religious institutions, or scouts, do they have liability for damages to these victims? Uh, yes, they do. And, and, and these cases are typically that are filed or a negligence case. Um, and a negligence case is premised on the principle that if a school or a church or, or a, a youth league has a special relationship with your child, meaning they're participating, then the law says that they have a legal duty to protect your child from foreseeable harm. We like to say as lawyers that the institution knew or should have known that this man was unsafe to be around children. Um, unfortunately, I find that it's a very common denominator in all these abuse cases to see that this person, the predator, has crossed boundaries with children. 
A man that crosses boundaries is a man that may molest a child. I think the best way to protect kids is to expose predators and the institutions that enable them. Now, Jeff, I've been doing my research and I'm having a hard time getting my head around this particular stat. Is it true that hundreds or potentially thousands of priests have been identified as pedophiles in America? Yes, there are thousands of priests that have been accused of molesting children in the Catholic Church. It's an astounding number. But my understanding is, is that 80% of the victims have not yet even come forward. That means there's thousands and thousands more of priests who have never been identified because there was no way for these victims to expose them through the legal process. That's good to know. Now, I'm sure the information you provided today will be helpful to anyone who suffered sexual abuse or knows someone who has. Can you tell our viewers more about your particular firm and how you guys are different from other personal injury firms in the way specifically that you handle sexual abuse cases? Sure. I mean, all that we do are sex abuse cases. And so my whole firm is geared up to empowering victims and help, to help them heal. And that begins with the first phone call. And what I know the most important thing to do is when that person calls me is for me to listen and to help them tell their story and to receive that story in a positive way. I'll give you an example, someone where I thought it was not handled correctly and they came to me. As a person called me and they were upset and they had called another law firm and they were explaining their story and the response from the other firm was, well, why didn't you run? Why didn't you scream? <gasps> and of course, that's an inappropriate response. And that's not understanding about why victims feel guilty and why they're compliant. Of course, they don't scream and run. We know that. But th their story needs to be heard in a positive way. And they need to be reassured that it's not their fault. And so the first thing is to listen and to help them tell their story. And by doing that, I think they begin to feel this, this sense of, of having a voice. Ultimately, that's what we want, is to give them a voice. Coming forward about the sexual abuse I'd experienced as a child was one of the hardest things that I had ever done. But the attorneys at Herman Law gave me a voice. They enabled me to take control and to fight back. And I no longer feel that I'm a victim. I'm a survivor. And I owe so much of that to the good people at Herman Law. And so it begins there. Um, when, we, when we file the cases and, and when we're proceeding with discovery, it's really important to understand that this is everything to our clients. This is their life. And so our job is to give them that security, to give them that empowerment. Um, and I think because that's all that we do at Herman Law is represent victims of sexual abuse. We help victims heal. And I will tell you, the best thing for me, I've been doing this a long time now, since 1997, is that every year I hear from victims um, who are survivors, um, especially when they were kids and now they're adults. Either their parents call me or they'll send me an email and they're telling me how great things are for them. I have kids I represented who are now lawyers and doctors and therapists and, and just out there living happy and healthy lives and their parents write me to thank me and that's for me that's everything that, that's so rewarding and that's why I love what I do. It sounds like the big reward you know if you or someone you love has suffered sexual abuse as a child I want you to know that the attorneys at Herman Law are here to advocate for you. They dedicate 100% of their practice to representing survivors of child sex abuse in civil cases, and they've obtained hundreds of millions of dollars in verdicts and settlements in child sex abuse cases. Please call the number on your screen now. Remember, the consultation is completely confidential, and it's free. Call Herman Law now. Hi. I'm sex abuse attorney Jeff Herman. The New York Child Victims Act created a two-year window of time for victims of childhood sexual abuse to file a lawsuit that had previously expired due to the statute of limitations. No matter how long ago you were abused, you can file a claim now, but this two-year window is about to end. If you were sexually abused as a child in New York by someone like a priest, foster father, or a school teacher, 
your right to file a claim may end on August 14th, 2021. I help victims heal by giving them a voice and holding institutions like churches, schools, and foster care agencies accountable. Most victims feel like they did something wrong and are afraid to come forward, so they suffer in silence. I understand this. It's not your fault. This window to file ends August 14th this year. Contact me before it's too late. Welcome back to our program. For those viewers just joining us, I'm Dr. Wendy Walsh, and with me today is attorney Jeff Herman, a nationally recognized trial lawyer and advocate for survivors of rape, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation. Now, Jeff, there have to be some warning signs, right, that parents should be aware of, those kind of red flags you hear about. Can you help parents understand what could be the red flags? Sure, sure, and actually I even developed an app for this. It's called Safe Parent, and, and it, people can find that uh, in the app stores. But, but what it is, is I went through statistically and I evaluated through all my experience, what are the common red flags that parents might look out for? And so I designed this quiz that's for parents to do with their children. And the quiz has questions. It's, it, it's designed, you ask your child about a man who's in your child's life. I use a man because 90% of predators are males. Um, it's a stat and that's what it is. So, um, so the questions are, for example, does this man want to spend time alone with your child? Does the man coach your child's team and not have kids on the team? That doesn't mean every coach is a predator, but it's a red flag. I want to know why this person coaching. You look coaching. at the cumulative amount of these flags. Exactly. Um, does, the, does this person offer alcohol or drugs to my child? Does this man communicate on social media? with my child? Does this man tickle or touch him roughhouse with my child? Any kind of touching. Um, does he want to take him on overnight trips? You know, a lot of it's common sense, but people don't want to think about predators that were our friends in that way. You know, people that we know. You know, it's very easy. When you think of the word pedophile, what comes to mind is a monster, right? In a trench coat, maybe with a knife on him. But that's not who the real predator is that we typically see. And so the, the real pedophile in his mind loves children. If you ask a predator, would you ever hurt a child? They would say, no, I love children because in their mind they are being loving. And so they're usually the charismatic person who loves kids and just wants to hang out with your kids. And I've heard that parents can't get their heads around it sometimes because that person is such a close family friend. Yes, and the parents are often groomed as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, you'll see the predator um, tell to these parents about how wonderful their kids are, and everyone wants to hear how cute their kid is. And here's the tough, here's the tough call. It's not tough when I say it, it's tough in reality though. If somebody makes you uncomfortable, remove them from your child's life. You eliminate almost the entire problem. Now, it's easy to say that. It's much tougher to do when it's uh, an uncle or a grandfather or a coach. 90% of kids that are abused are abused by somebody they know. Mm -hmm. It's not typically the stranger. You know, we used to grow up learning about stranger danger. Well, strangers can be dangerous, but statistically speaking, kids are more likely to be abused by somebody they know. And the way that this person, the predator, accomplishes that is they groom or seduce the child. Grooming is a process that a predator uses to gain their trust it may start off with a simple pat on the shoulder, uh, sit on my lap, different things to gain the child's trust. Once the predator gains a child's trust, they eventually lead it to sexual abuse. And so what happens is the victim becomes what we call a compliant victim. It means they're participating in the, the sex. They're obviously not consenting, they're kids. But because they are compliant and are participating, they think they've done something wrong. I was first sexually abused by a priest when I was nine years old. I didn't know what was going on or what was happening. I blamed myself for what happened for so many years. I didn't tell anybody about it, not my family, not my friends, not my wife. The other thing that happens is that kids, when they are sexually abused, they're traumatized. Many develop post-traumatic stress disorder, or you know, PTSD. And it isn't until much later on in life when people are reflecting on their lives 
that they connect the problems they may be having in life with the sexual abuse that they suffered as a child. And so the combination of these factors makes it very difficult and not unexpected that victims will wait years and sometimes decades to come forward. Right, and especially when they were so young, when their brain was developing, and they need a fully formed adult brain to look back on their life and see that connection. And here's the, the one message I, I, I like to give parents, which is that you should never leave your child alone with a man until your child is old enough to understand that the person most likely to molest them is the person you're telling them to trust. You know, one of the things you mentioned is the feelings of shame and embarrassment that so many victims feel about this abusive experience. And for many of them, that's the big issue. It's the big stumbling block. Can you tell us about privacy concerns? How do you protect victims' privacy? Sure. Yeah, I know there's a lot of victims out there who are hesitant to come forward because of their privacy concerns. So the first thing is, is that if a victim chooses, they can file under what's called a pseudonym which is a John Doe. So their names never have to be used, um, their names are never out there in public, and they can maintain their privacy. I um, mean, that's important. Some victims want their names out there, some don't. It's a personal decision. It does not impact the case at all. In fact, it's one of those things where I tell the victims, this is your choice. Empower yourself to decide how you want to handle it. And so their names are never used. Um, to the extent that the records are requested, there's confidentiality agreements, and so they are protected. One other, I'm sure, barrier to entry for many former victims is cost. They worry this is going to cost a lot of money. Can you give us an idea what it could cost them? Sure. Well, it doesn't cost them anything to hire me. I do all these cases on a contingency fee, meaning that I only get paid if and when I recover money for them. I get paid a percentage from what I recover. Same thing with costs. I advance all the costs in the cases, um, and those get paid back at the end. If there's nothing ever recovered, they never owe anything. So it's it's um, there's really no cost. It doesn't literally wow. cost them anything. Wow, that's good to know. And your firm has a very impressive record of recoveries for sexual abuse victims. Can you tell us like what kinds of recoveries people might expect? Well, every case is different. Um, I believe any time an adult has molested a child, the damages are, are into the millions of dollars. Um, wow. What I can tell you is our verdicts that I've had. Um, I mean, I've had verdicts ranging um, in a Catholic priest case of over $100 million. To uh, one victim? To one victim. Oh. And I've had verdicts um, against institutions, um, charter schools, and uh, five million, three million. I mean, it, it's a range. Every case is different, but I think these are significant cases. I have to say, those are some significant recoveries. And when I do hear those numbers, the first thing I think is, wow, the damages must have been so great, the personal damage to these victims. Um, I'm sure that no amount of money can truly compensate these victims for all the pain they've suffered. If you or someone you love has suffered sexual abuse as a child, I want you to know the attorneys at Herman Law are here to advocate for you. They dedicate 100% of their practice to representing survivors of child sexual abuse in civil cases, and they've obtained hundreds of millions of dollars in verdicts and settlements in child sex abuse cases. Please call the number on your screen now. Remember, the consultation is completely confidential and it's free. Call Herman Law now. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm sex abuse attorney Jeff Herman. The New York Child Victims Act created a two-year window of time for victims of childhood sexual abuse to file a lawsuit that had previously expired due to the statute of limitations. No matter how long ago you were abused, you can file a claim now, but this two-year window is about to end. If you were sexually abused as a child in New York by someone like a priest, foster father, or a school teacher, your right to file a claim may end on August 14th, 2021. I help victims heal by giving them a voice and holding institutions like churches, schools, and foster care agencies accountable. Most victims feel like they did something wrong and are afraid to come forward, so they suffer in silence. I understand this. It's not your fault. 
This window to file ends August 14th this year. Contact me before it's too late. Welcome back to our program. For those viewers who are just joining us, I'm Dr. Wendy Walsh, and with me today is sex abuse attorney Jeff Herman, a nationally recognized trial lawyer and advocate for survivors of rape, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation. Now, Jeff, based on your experience in sexual abuse cases, though, especially those involving children, let's talk more about post-traumatic stress disorder. You touched on it, but it's a very real diagnosis. Yeah, and this is, this is one of the keys to understanding what victims have gone through and how they can move forward to heal. And I say healing's a journey, it's not a destination, you know. Victims know better than anybody, there's no snap of the fingers and they're healed, it's a process. But there's milestones in that process and, and one of those milestones is really starting to deal with the PTSD or the post-traumatic stress disorder. So, and to explain what I'm talking about, a good example I think is if a person was walking through the woods on a leisurely hike and all of a sudden a bear came charging at them. We go into what's called the stress response and our brain releases various chemicals including adrenaline. And then there's all these physiological changes that take place in order to prepare for this trauma of the bear attacking us. People refer to that as going into fight or flight or freeze. And it's an instantaneous decision that the brain will make in order to determine what is the best way for survival. And so, you know, we've evolved this way. The mind races in order for us to determine what the safest course of action is. So for a child who's been sexually abused, they often develop post-traumatic stress disorder and they also will have these triggers. And so for a child who's developed PTSD, there are subconscious and conscious triggers. A conscious trigger will be they're sending them back to school. They have to go back to the classroom, or back to church, or back to Boy Scouts, wherever they were abused. The scene of the crime is obvious trigger. Driving past the institution where they were abused. Um, there are triggers, could be, for example, the smell, the cologne that the abuser was wearing. Or oftentimes, kids will see someone, even as adults, who looks like their perpetrator, and that's a trigger. So when these triggers happen to a child who was sexually abused, all of a sudden, they're feeling the same kinds of feelings they had while they were being abused. Now I will say most kids in my experience who are sexually abused go into the freeze state. That's where they almost, it's like playing dead and that's a very common um, response because it's so dangerous and as a child your brain decides play dead because you might be killed if you don't and that's what the child thinks. And so um, their subconscious triggers could be something that you, you don't even recognize as a trigger, but something in your brain is reminded of the perpetrator of the abuse, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're having an anxiety attack. And, and Dr. Walsh, as you know, when a child is sexually abused, oftentimes it's their first sexual experience. Mm. Now that child, as they grow up, every time they have a sexual relationship, it's a trigger. And that is so unfair and so difficult to live with. You know, triggers I've heard from victims tell me stories of the way the, a, a priest touched them, the back of their head, or the way the, the, the words that were used by the perpetrator. And so all these things impact relationships and when you're reacting to triggers in a sexual relationship, it interferes with your relationship. That makes you depressed. People start self-medicating, they may drink, they may turn to drugs that makes them depressed. And then as you mentioned, there's real f f medical issues that develop as a result of being sexually abused. Another thing that we see oftentimes is when people are going to sleep at night, they're relaxing, you know, and your, 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 your mind starts to wander. Now let's say the trigger's over here. You're trying to relax and think about all these nice things in your day, and eventually as you're going to sleep, your mind wanders to that trigger, and then boom, your brain releases this adrenaline, you're having an anxiety attack, and the last thing you can do now is fall asleep. That's why many victims of sexual abuse have difficulty sleeping. It's because of these triggers. Or they might have a dream where the trigger goes off and they wake up and they're sweating and they don't know why. It's because it's a trigger. And so dealing with this PTSD and understanding what the cause of the PTSD is, is very important in helping victims heal. 
And that's really what it's about. And, and you know, whenever I get a case, the first thing that I tell my client is that this case is about helping you heal. Everything else will follow. You know, I want you to tell your story and have a voice. That's the most important thing I can do. I know, you know, that, you know, the case eventually, you know, will we'll file or, uh, you know, and move down, move down the process. But being able to have a voice and have a measure of justice. There is healing that can come from that. Oh yeah, there certainly is. Now you mentioned that if a victim suffered sexual abuse years ago as a child, so many are reluctant to come forward given the emotional issues you've just been talking about. But what are the reasons for victims to come forward now after so much time has passed? What helps them come forward? What's the benefit? Right, well right now there are victims out there who are determining what to do, trying to figure out do I come forward? Do I tell my family? Do I call a lawyer? Do I call a therapist? And what we see is that the reasons they're coming forward now is because there's this collective empowerment taking place. You know, when it's just you against the big Catholic church, it's a scary thing. And victims don't feel safe to come forward. But I often see when another victim of a particular priest has come forward, then the person thinks, you know what, I'm not alone. It wasn't my fault, I was a victim. Because even today, you know, as, as an adult, thinking about the abuse, the victims think about it through the lens of their child. And so it's hard to come forward, but that empowerment they get from another victim coming forward and standing up enables and empowers other victims to come forward. And they see that, you know, I think for a lot of victims, and there was a victim who, who, a survivor who recently shared with this to me. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this for three years, whether or not I was gonna come forward. When I first came forward about what happened to me as a child, I didn't know where to go to or who to turn to. But I'm glad I reached out to Jeff Herman and the attorneys at Herman Law. They made the process as comfortable as it could possibly be. And I know that they've been fighting for me every step of the way. Obviously, it's a scary thing, but when you see other victims who have taken the step and survived, and in fact are thriving and beginning to heal, we hope that that enables them to come forward. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for joining our program today. The information that you are sharing with people is so invaluable to parents out there, to kids, and to any adult who has suffered sexual abuse or knows somebody who has. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Walsh. If you or someone you love has suffered sexual abuse, I want you to know that the attorneys at Harmon Law are here to advocate for you. They dedicate 100% of their practice to representing survivors of sexual abuse in civil cases, and they've obtained hundreds of millions of dollars in verdicts and settlements in sex abuse cases. Please call the number on your screen now. Remember, the consultation is completely confidential, and it's free. Call Herman Law now. This is a paid advertisement for Herman Law.